Mate, um, coaches, we, we'll get underway. Um, still a few joining in and some stuff like that, but um, you guys are all on time and uh, let's try and keep to some form of schedule. Um, just really quickly, um, Reese from Wyndham Basketball, I'm really excited about the um, uh, tonight and possibly the, the possibility of uh, making something like this happen ongoing. Um, I think it's going to be um, a really a good way for coaches to connect and learn during this really challenging period. Obviously, with the shutdown and there's some bigger things at play, uh, but the opportunity to connect with each other and keep some form of normality with some basketball and also invest in some professional development is a great opportunity that sort of come out of this as a byproduct. So, um, really excited about that. Uh, very appreciative of everyone signing up. We only put this online just over you know 24, 25 hours ago. Um, and even more appreciative to Jared and uh, Kennedy uh, to put their hand up to present because they got about 26 hours notice. So they certainly didn't get much of a heads up and they've put together great presentations uh, and we'll all learn a lot from that. Just some housekeeping, if we can all stay on mute, that will really help the process and limit distractions. Um, and then if you've got questions, just pop them in the chat group, send them directly to Wyndham Basketball, which is me. Um, so right at the bottom, get to W um, and send them directly to me. And then at the right time, I'll just ask the presenter uh, the question. So if we keep that as the process, I think that'll work best. Um, other than that, it is our first time doing this. So if there is any uh, teething problems or any issues, bear with us. Uh, we have done our best to prepare and done a bit of a practice run. We think it will work fine uh, and we will record it and put it up online. So, um, so if you need to go back and check notes or if, you know, anything like that, your internet was a bit slow, it should be fine on my end and that's what's recording it. So you should have a good copy that you can go back and watch later on. Um, G's going to start us off. So I'd like to introduce him really quickly. Jared Hillier um, from down the morning to Peninsula Way. Look at his beautiful backyard he's sitting in at the moment. Um, but outstanding coach, very innovative. Um, that's the thing I think that impresses me the most, his willingness to try and, and do things and do things differently. It gives me extreme anxiety, his topic tonight. Uh, and I say that very seriously, I'm not joking. Uh, it gives me extreme anxiety, the zero step and all the funky footwork. Um, but, you know, Jared's won a national championship with big country. He's the high performance uh, hub head coach at Casey. Um, big V uh, championship women coach. And also his current project is the Hillier Hoops. Um, so he's a very experienced coach um, and, and an outstanding um, innovative coach and we'll all learn a lot and that's enough talking from me. I'd like to hand over to Jared to um, present, his, present his topic. No worries. Thanks, Reid. Uh, thanks to you and the team from uh, Wyndham, mate. Oh, I know it's a, it's a big uh, project to get everyone together, um, but through these unique times, it gives us a great opportunity to, uh, um, to think outside the square, um, to grow our game as well. I know as coaches, we're always saying we're time poor to reflect on our own coaching and, and come up with, you know, whether it be formalising our theories or growing a coaching philosophy. So um, opportunities such as this, you know, is going to greatly help everyone. But we've definitely got time on our side. So um, we've got plenty of time to formalise our, our theories. Uh, so my, my topic tonight is, uh, what am I doing? Zero step. Uh, so I've got a, a present presentation put together, um, there is a number of, I guess, game film and training film throughout this. So, um, jot your notes down if you've got any and we'll, we'll, um, we'll definitely cover it all off at the end. Um, for me, this is something we've been working on for two and a half years now, maybe coming close to three years. Um, so, it's by, by no means perfect uh, at the moment, but yeah, it's an ever-growing uh, topic that I'm pretty interested in. Whether or not you, you end up taking this and implementing it with your team, your athletes, well, that's up to you. Um, but I think at the very least, uh, getting a basic understanding of it uh, in case you face it as, as a coach um, or you do have, have athletes come to you and want to learn it. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely a topic you want to at least touch base on. Uh, for any, any of you guys or the coaches that have followed uh, our journey over the last two and a bit years, uh, what I've seen there's two parts to this. There's the skip catch, uh, which is the initial catch, and then there's a zero step, 
um, the zero step in at the end of the play once once we pick up our dribble, and, and I'll cover off both uh, with, with a skip catch, the initial footwork upon receiving the ball, so the initial catch. Uh, we come across this. We had a couple national. Uh, level players who were preparing for, I think it was the uh, Asia Cup or the qualifiers. Um, so I'll start to flick through some film to get a bit of an understanding of what they're going to face. Uh, so then we could work into our individuals and our team training to best prepare them for their up and coming tournament. Um, the, the main area I took away was the footwork and their use of the skip catch. Now, we've drastically watered this down as to what you would see if you were to watch a Korea or a Japan play. Um, but it's something we initially put in to help our players learn to defend it. Then teaching the offensive side of it become more fun than the defensive side. So after the tournament, we kept going with the offensive side of things. Um, and yeah, developed it into what it is today. So I'll play some clips just so you get an understanding of what I'm, what I'm talking about. Uh, what I'd like you to, to look at is not all of these clips are perfect. Uh, but would like the player to receive the ball with one foot only on the ground and then skip into a two-foot jump stop as such. In this breakdown, we've got the defender deliberately giving a lead foot, which would then rip a step across and attack. Uh, if the defender has their arms out, that's a catch-and-shoot situation. Uh, so that's a basic look at uh, the breakdown without any uh, defence in there. Now, the difference between what we're seeing at international tournaments and what we're working on here is Korea and Japan will generally have two or three steps, then skip into the stop. I mean, for us, we felt as though that would be too much of a radical move um, to implement here first, so we shortened it up to one step into the skip. Um, and look, early on, we, we were called for a few travels. Uh, but to be honest, the ones that were called travels were travels anyway, where the players shuffled their feet or took two steps, then skipped. Um, so, you know, that's just a, a bit of an early on teething issue we had. Uh, now we're two years down the track. I, I don't even notice it um, when I watch our, our players go out there and do their thing. But no, I normally only watch it if another coach says something or... Everyone in the crowd yells out travel. It sort of gets my uh, attention. Well, the basic theory of the skip catch uh, is to take the closeouts with downhill movement. So we're traditionally a dribble drive team where we like to be downhill and attacking as often as possible. Uh, so we're looking to attack the lead foot of the defender. Oh, it's a short closeout. It's skip into the catch and shoot. Uh, you can check out some of the variants of the, the footwork and you can see the extent some other um, countries utilise it to. Uh, Korea and Japan under 17, 19, their women's national teams are probably the two best examples. Uh, and like I mentioned before, we've watered it down um, to the level of officiating within uh, our country. And that's not to say that our officials aren't uh, on top of it. It's just um, there's not a lot of people doing it. So it's same as with players and coaches. We're good at what we're exposed to the most. Um, and because... Our officials aren't exposed to it all the time, uh, especially on your VJBL Friday nights and your juniors. It can be pretty hit and miss. Um, so we've watered it down a bit to try and avoid some of the um, officiating hurdles we've had. Uh, I've got a few clips here of it in, in games. Um, so I encourage you to just watch your feet and watch how active they are. <clears throat> um, yeah, and take, take your notes as you please. I'll just give you a quick over, overview of, or I guess, some in-game content um, to see how it unfolds. The main thing for us is having active feet 
Um, we're not against players if they wish to one, two, you know, stride, stop or stride, step into it, or they wish to use inside or outside foot pivot. We're, we're not about saying one uh, is better than the other. This is more so a footwork concept that I'm running with. Uh, with the juniors, they're probably, it's more across the team because it's new to them and there's not as much, um, I guess, prior learning uh, to un unravel with them and get the new stuff into play. Uh, as senior players, some are hesitant or some just don't like using it. And, and that's fine as well. Like if they're late 20s, early 30s and they've been playing for longer than most of our juniors have been alive, like I'm not going to try and completely change their game. Um, but that being said, you know, some of the seniors have changed, made the change, uh, and it has been pretty effective in our offensive system. Okay, so I've gone to now the zero step, which is a really fun part. Uh, the zero step is the footwork utilised once the player is in motion. So we put the ball to the floor, uh, we're attacking the ring, we, we pick the ball up, and then we go and play from there. I've got some training clips here, which are really over-exaggerated. Um, so we've been working on this a little bit with our Casey Hub athletes, uh, with the help of Brad and Ish, uh, who are out there coaching with myself. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see how the guys go. Just just be mindful, this is pretty over-exaggerated. All right, so with that, the, the basic theory of the zero step is to gain the additional step once the ball has been picked up, which is now legal with FIBA's rule adjustment or the new interpretation. When I say new, I think it's coming on three years. It's actually been in play. Uh, it took a little while, I think, for coaches to start playing around with it in, in Australia. So we're, we're probably about two and a half years into it. Um, I, I first come across it when Billy Mildenhall put a presentation together for the directors of coaches in at um, Basketball Victoria. So he, he explained the rule and uh, I didn't think much of it then because I didn't think it'd, it'd take off. Uh, and then a couple months after that, uh, I was at the Youth Olympics with the Australian three on three women. Uh, noticed some of the, the nations there utilizing it. And you could probably appreciate with three on three how much space there already is, then giving players an extra step to utilize. Um, it was something we weren't used to, and we certainly weren't prepared for it, nor were most countries there. Um, and again, it was pretty hit and miss with how it was officiated uh, at those games. Um, we watched a few teams training, or when we're training, all the half courts are next to each other, uh, side by side. So I was watching a few of the teams, and again, I didn't really think much of it until we started playing against the teams and, and realised how hard it was to defend. So. Um, from there, I guess you could say the passion to research and develop it really uh, kicked off uh, and I've been running with it ever since. Um, so one of the things to remember is as long as a player remains in motion, uh, you have this step when you pick the ball up, which we call the zero step, but in the rules, I believe they refer to it as the gather, so gathering the ball, but we utilise the word zero uh, because when we're breaking it down with our players, it's easier for players to count zero, one, two, and then yelling at gather one, two. So we just went with zero. Uh, and then you have an additional two steps. So three points of contact with the ground. Um, if you want to get into when and where you can use jump stops, like a two foot jump stop, uh, we've avoided it completely. Um, however, you know, I'd be happy to have a chat with someone if I wanted to about um, using that, but pretty much any time you put two feet to the ground, the traditional rules apply. All right, so I've got a fair few clips here of uh, in-game uh, use of the zero step. Some are travels, um, some aren't. Some you'll see have shorter steps, so we're not, they're not all long, explosive steps. Some are short jabs to really confuse defenses. So in the last clip uh, is probably my favourite clip where there's contact, and then we play through the contact with the additional steps. What I'd like you to probably look at is the steps is one part and you're going to notice that because it's unusual and it's different. Um, probably have a look at how defense reacts once we've already taken one step. Generally, you'll see defense stop playing defense because 
they're used to that, that one step and then walling up or, or, or contesting the shot. But just have a look how many times we just walk past the defender as such uh, because their traditional mindset is the pick up one step then lay up. thinking if we could make a layup, it would be a lot better team. And I uh, happen to agree with you. Uh, look, the importance of the zero step in the modern game. Uh, the zero step is becoming more and more prevalent in, in the international stage. Uh, there, there is a risk of some nations being left behind uh, who fail to invest. But it's each to their own. Um, I know the more I watch European-based basketball, it, it seems there's some seamless zero step action there, which um, is great to see. And obviously the NBA... It's really hard with the NBA because it is just such a different beast. Um, but I, I can't remember if it's Half Court Hoops or one of the people on YouTube have got uh, the Zero Step Chronicles, which is funny to watch uh, and follow. But more and more uh, frequently used in, in the NBA as well. Um, obviously, the you know the US college system, the high school system, it, it's it's for the most part a different set of rules around the footwork. So you know it's not really going to apply there. Um, there's a potential for athletes and teams to create a large point of difference. So th this is where we really come into it. Uh, so the club I coach at Southern Penn, uh, our senior program is an extension of our development pathway. So we play a lot of young players. Um, so for us coming up against more experienced players, we, we need to try and find you know, a point of difference that keeps us relevant and competitive in the games. So this is one area where we felt as though we could really exploit it um, and, and be, as, be a little bit more competitive. Um, so it's hard to defend. Uh, and we'll place the word nations with teams. There's many, a lot of teams there that aren't investing in the, the modern type of footwork, you know, and then in turn create an advantage for those who do. Uh, and the zero step look, it gives players a greater range of freedom of moves and counter moves. Um, and again, making them harder to defend and uh, contain. Some of the roadblocks and, and how we overcome them, like th these are the, the three main ones. And the second one's probably going through most people's minds at the moment. But the first one, the perception, the most coaches I speak to are worried about what other coaches will think. Uh, and it's a massive one where perception seems to um, cloud people's ability or want to change and do something outside the box. Um, you know, for me personally, I I'm not too concerned about what people think about my concepts but I appreciate you know a lot of the younger coaches or people just starting off don't want to be seen to be doing the wrong thing um, but but I'm a huge advocate for you know where's the coaching uh, fraternity need to really get behind each other and build confidence with coaches to try new things because at the end of the day it, it's not about us at all uh, it's about best preparing our players for the next level and, and whatever that next level may be some of it might be from going from a domestic program to making a rep team or going from a rep team to making the big V program. Um, and some of us are really fortunate to have, you know, athletes in our program go from our seniors to state or national um, level. So uh, my, my theory is whatever best helps our athletes develop. Um, but, the, you know, you will have to wear, if you want to invest in this, you will have to wear a little bit of um, judgment from your peers, but, yeah, that's just the way it is. Referee impact. Uh, more coaches are concerned with how to be officiated. And I 100% understand this one because I've been living it for the last two and a half years. Um, what I will say is the last 12 months has been vastly different to the first season and a half. Um, it, it, it's been, I guess you could say we, we've had a lot more, hey, there's a question. We've had a lot more um, fluent play within our games. We did a, 
Well, I did a bit of a study two years ago as opposed to the last season a bit. And our turnover rate is 1.5 turnovers more per game after we introduced the new uh, footwork. So there's not a great deal more turnovers or travels being called in games. And I think a lot of it comes down to you know, education, um, talking with the officials. The arguing side of things isn't going to get us too far at all. Um, so, yeah, ha having a chat with officials before the game, having a chat with your director of coaching, who can then in turn chat with the officials at the club. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. I think that's the way to go. And the lack of knowledge, um, a lot of coaches aren't, aren't understanding or know the rule. Okay, so the most important aspects to teach. Um, explain the rule first. Uh, this is with your athletes and the zero or, or gather whatever wording you want to use. Um, then you've got your two steps to finish. Demonstrate examples of where and when we could utilise the zero step. Um, now, they don't have to use the zero step all the time. There, there's going to be a number of uh, times in a game where you know your, your traditional footwork is fine and um, you'll be better off using it. And then there's going to be other times where utilising the zero step is um, advantageous. Encourage the players to constantly count zero, one, two. That's a, that's a training, so they can start to get a feel for you know the amount of steps and, and talk themselves through it. Uh, create an environment of you know creativity and grow the imagination. So again, let, let them go and explore, and we have to sit back a little bit as coaches and, and live with the mess. Um, and yeah, see what they can create. I'll give two examples here in game where you can just see the players. Uh, a little bit caught up with should they use a step or shouldn't they? And, and these are things that you're going to see a lot of, um, especially in the early stages. And we still see it now and uh, it's completely fine, but you'll see in these clips just the hesitation and the thought process of what to do, but at game pace, apparently it all but turns into a turnover. They're just two, two quick examples um, of what we live with on a weekly basis in games. Uh, look at the best practice for teaching the zero step. Implement the basic movement patterns first. Uh, so some of the prior slides and videos, and there's a lot more I've got online, so you can just jump online and check them out. And if you have any questions, by all means, hit me up. Uh, create drills in small-sided games that uh, promote the use of the zero step. Uh, we award, so if we're doing our one-on-one -on -one stuff or two-on-two, three-on-three at the start of training, you get one point from a basket, but if you make a basket utilizing the zero step, you get two points. So, and just another way to promote it. Uh, like we said before, uh, build an environment uh, of imagination and creativity, and we as coaches need to be hands off um, for, for most of this because it is very much about the player learning and exploring. And look, and when it does happen, encourage and celebrate the use of the zero step. Oh, that's a big one. I think the coaches down our way do really, really well when players do use it, whether it gets called for a travel or not, uh, they celebrate. So then it gives the, the athlete confidence. Um, and the decision-making is a true hero of the teachings, uh, when to use it, when not to use it. So again, like a training, uh, you might have a lot of advantage, disadvantage play uh, and, and your small sided games. And that is as soon as the players get the basic concept down pattern, the basic movement patterns, like chuck a defender in there straight away. Um, because you know, perfecting it with no defender, you really are going to have to relearn it as soon as you chuck a defender uh, in front of them. So I'd encourage you to do that really midway through the first time you, you implement this with the players. Uh, where to from here and what's next? Like me personally, we're going to start to work on the length of the steps, uh, utilising a combination of short and long steps within the uh, the three steps, I might be short, long, short, or you know, any variation. Uh, change of direction multiple times. So a, a double Euro step, or you might take a straight step, then a 45 degree, then a straight step. So all those different combinations, and then combining the two. Uh, so the length of steps and the change of direction, which, you know, which is what I call funky footwork, if you follow any of my stuff. So you know, that, that's kind of where we're going with that. And then blending the, the the common, when I say common moves, off the bounce, moves they already use um, and have learnt. So, you know, can we add an extra step? 
as either to gain advantage or a bailout option uh, and you know, creating more small sided games to promote the use of the zero step. So that's where we're heading with it. Um, you know, I appreciate there's probably a few questions around it, um, but hit me up with it. I'll, I'm happy to talk footwork for hours on end. Um, it's, it's what I'm most invested in. Uh, so I'm happy to keep growing the use of the zero step. And you know, if people have ideas that, that can make my stuff better um, or what I'm working on better, I'm all ears. So yeah, I'm happy to, uh, to keep the conversation going. Awesome, mate. Um, there's a couple of questions. I'm sure there'll be a couple more come through. Um, first one was a little bit of a in-between one. So you find you get called for more travels on that initial footwork, the um, the skip step, or on the um, on the zero step in the layup. Which do you think you have more issues with the players learning, but then also getting called for uh, on that? Um, yeah, it, it's an interesting one. We we implemented them at separate times. So we nearly had a full season of the initial cut, the skip catch. And the following season, we put the zero step in. Um, so by the end of that first season, we had that down pat and the travels backed off. But then because we started using the zero step, the travels come back. Um, I, I would think if I had to bet on one or the other, I would say the zero step attracts more attention, uh, especially as you're going through the key way. The, you know, the referees seem to be really you know, focused on the, on the ball hammer going through the paint. So as soon as something that's a little bit abnormal happens, um, it gets called. But, I mean, like I said, the last 12 months, we haven't had any real issues with it. Uh, and that's Friday nights or Big V or, or any level. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I would say slightly more towards the zero step, Paul. Yep. Awesome, mate. Um, this was an interesting one. What's your advice to people defending the zero step and the... The skip step, you know, obviously you've taught your players to use it and utilise that to create advantages. Um, what sort of your teaching points do people have to defend that nowadays if they come up against Southern Penn? Particularly, yeah. uh, where, where, where are these champ women team? So. Look, I, I would think you just sub a player off and go four on five and let us go. <laughs> no, I would think with the, the skip catch, it is definitely we look to get up and deny. So they actually can't utilise the skip catch. Um, we'll, we'll force the team to either back cut on us um, or catch it going away from the basket, because obviously if someone wants to skip catch going away from the basket, we're happy to live with that. Um, and with the, the zero step, we haven't really come up against anyone yet that uses it. Yep. Uh, the, the one or two teams that have had a, a pretty good uh, handle on it will, will generally send it to your non-preferred hand, which, again, at a senior level is pretty, pretty common. But then early contact, like with, with a chest blow or a chest bump, or some sort of physical contact on your way into the paint because um, players are a lot less likely to use a zero step after they've had some sort of physical contact. Yep. Hopefully that um, answers that. That's um, good stuff. Um, there's heaps of questions coming in, mate, so I'm going to try and work through them. A couple around yep. um, younger kids. So when should we start to teach that? Uh, there was also a question with young kids, would you start with just one, two, three, rather than zero, one, two? Um, yep. But basically, a couple of questions from people around, you know, do you start from Aussie hoops with the, the traditional stuff or do you start to add that in straight away? And also, you know, could you consider changing your terminology? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think with the, the wording, it is 100% whatever your team picks up. Whatever you as a coach are most comfortable coaching, uh, whatever sits best with you. Because if you know it, you're confident, that's then going to transfer to your athletes. Um, so if you're confident with it, whatever you want to call it, um, it's completely up to you. Um, but then ultimately, whatever the players pick up uh, best. So, yeah, the, the wording is, you know, it's fair game, whatever you want to call it. Uh, in regards to what age, we've got uh, players from under 12s. So top age under 12s, if I'm working them out in an individual environment, I'm starting to, to utilise it, as well as your jump stop, pivot, you're still your fundamentals are still your fundamentals. Yep. This is something at an earlier age we put on top of yep. their fundamentals to use. Um, the, the younger kids, I think by under 14s, it starts to become a really big advantage because that athleticism starts to kick in uh, for boys and girls that are top age 14s where you start to get, you know, some of those kids grow and they, they do have big, long, explosive steps. 
Um, but for me personally, as soon as I get to that top age 12s, there would be a mix of their, the traditional fundamentals and uh, the new footwork. But by under 14s, I'd be neck deep in, in teaching skip catch and zero step. What about, gee, this is more one from me. I'm just, I've got that many coming in. I've got to just come on. Do you teach the, the one-step layup as well? So that just initial same foot, same hand. So essentially yep. you would have the one-step, the traditional two-step, and the, you know, the, the essentially what is a three-step layup with that zero-step. So you would teach yeah. three of those to your athletes. Yeah, so once they get to about under 16s, there's nothing traditional within our workouts. Um, it is efficiency and movement. Um, and with that, we try and reduce as many steps where possible, which contradicts the zero step um, and removing dribbles as well. So if you've already got an advantage, there's no need to utilize extra steps. Um, so that may be, you know, you come flying through the key and you take off left foot, left hand layup. So a bit of an unorthodox finish. Yep. Yep, we're, we're for that as well. But we, we would then mix it up. Um, with some of our advantage disadvantage stuff where we're kind of guiding more so the defensive player into forcing the offense to make I guess a desired outcome that, that we're after but um, on whatever at the end of the day you've got to put the ball in the bucket so yeah, yeah, uh, whatever yeah. they use to do that uh, we're all for I'm all for that and hence that's why the decision making really is the king in, in this situation like all their footwork can be fantastic and it doesn't matter what footwork you use if your decision making is poor, uh, your footwork's kind of irrelevant. Um, another left to field one. Uh, so, any thoughts on practicing or seeing passing out of the zero step? So, you know, you get to that, um, you know, you do your two steps and you take that extra one to create the angle to maybe make a, a, a pass in a tight space to the uh, perimeter player or something like that. So, is that something you guys teach as well, or is it more to finish on that last step? Uh, no, we, we will have specific drills for passing. So we'll utilise, you know, some players will utilise a zero step and do it, some more of the traditional footwork. Uh, you know, hook pass over your head, round the back, between your legs. Um, we'll have some drills where you can only use one hand. So it'll be three on O. Uh, you have to get three passes before you can score. Offence can only use one hand at a time. That, that's for, you know, scoring and passing. Uh, and then we'll chuck defence in there. So it'll be three on two. Again, the same concept. You, you can only use one hand. Uh, and some players are now at the point where they're naturally using the zero step to get an advantage. Yep. Um, or some are shortening up and only use a one step because they've already got an advantage. Um, but no, we're, we're, we've got saying games, play, our players at this point in time are more, I wouldn't say focused on scoring as such, but that has been more prevalent in our trainings than the passing. The passing part's only really been the last six months. Yeah. So I would say with confidence that it hasn't quite started to seep into our games yet. Yeah. I think it's interesting your point about basically the defenders are so ingrained in those two steps. On that third one, they basically, well, they wall up, but most of them just stand up and let you go by. That was an interesting point on that. So um, there's a heap more, mate. So if you can bear with me, I'll keep um, putting them to you. Yeah. Um, how would you introduce the younger kids, under-12s, under-14s, um, they haven't seen it before. What, what's the what's the very base you start with? I mean, I know there's two different concepts there, but how do you yeah. uh, go with that? Uh, so we, we utilise those, you know, the little rubber dots you can put on the ground. Um, so I've got three red and three blue. Um, so again, the players have come through, and it's more so from the foul line with the real little ones. And I'll put those dots down on the ground, um, and you need to step on those dots one foot at a time towards the basket. Yeah. Um, and then try and score. And as they get older, we drag those dots further and further apart and further and further away from the ring. So the steps need to be longer and more explosive. Yeah. What we're starting to work with now is adjust the distance. So the first one might be long, second one will be short, and the third one will be long. So they're yeah. um, using a variation. So well, I use the dots because it gives the younger players a visual and actual a destination as such where... I found when I was trying to do it without the dots, it was uh, it was pretty tough. Yeah. Um, but as soon as we put the dots on the ground, everyone picked it up straight away. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I was kind of me, a bit of a, a poor coaching effort from me not to think of it earlier. Yep. Uh, that's a good point. Um, basically, this question is, uh, I guess, do, you, do your players get it all discouraged? So they get called for a couple of travels. You know, you've gone through it. Obviously, it's hopefully getting better with education of players, coaches and refs. 
Um, but have you found that players sort of, you know, maybe get discouraged from utilising it because they're called for a couple of travels or how did you sort of can encourage them to keep going and persist? Yeah, look, I'm, especially with the Junes, I'm probably the main cheerleader. I don't know, not, a, not an overly attractive cheerleader. Um, however, I'm, I'm probably the biggest cheerleader uh, at the game. We, we get called for a travel. Like, I'm the first one yelling out, hey, you know, great job. Why do you use a zero step? Why do you use a skip catch? Um, ultimately, players getting that um, praise from their coach and then being left on the court. Like, you know, players, as soon as they make a mistake, some expect to get dragged. We're not dragging players for a mistake. Um, and I'm cheerleading my whole way through the game. And I guess that comes with not really worrying too much about what other people think. Yeah. Um, well, it is tough because, you know, you have referees t- tell you sometimes, you know, oh, that's a travel, you need to do this. All right, you ref, I'll coach, and we'll go from there. Yeah. Um, the, the hardest one's the parents because, you, you know, I, I guess the parents kind of think that their child's career is going to be, you know, it's make or break at bottom age 14s. Yeah. Um, they make a couple of mistakes that the NBA dreams over. So I guess it, it, it's a little bit of a, a sales pitch. Um, and, and, you know, during trainings, I'll, I'll deliberately speak loud about, you know, how we don't care if we get called for a travel and this is why we're doing it. It's a long-term game, not short-term yeah. gain and all those sorts of things. Um, but look, I, I, I think it, it's a buy-in early and I think if the, if the players see their coach has their back. Yeah. Um, we, we've done, oh, I think we've done a really good job of, of telling the players, you know, like, without discrediting the referees at all. It's like, hey, they're calling what they're used to calling. Yeah. Um, so we need to keep doing this so they get the experience, we get the experience and we'll move forward together. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a... It's it's a cheerleader thing. We've got to praise it. Whether the ball goes in or not, whether it's a travel or not, we need to praise it the same way yeah. um, in both circumstances. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's really good. Um, how much time a week do you spend on footwork? And I know this is probably a pretty hard one. <laughs> I guess it depends what you're doing. But um, yeah. I guess maybe if you put it as a percentage rather than time, because obviously yep. everyone's time is going to be different. Domestic might get 45 minutes or an hour. Um, college coaches are getting three hours a day. We're all getting different times. So what sort of um, you know, how much would it, as a percentage, I guess, or what's your emphasis on that? Was it every drill? Was it, you know? Yeah, look, I'll go from the seniors and work my way down. From the seniors, the pre-season is pretty saturated with it um, as part of small side of games. So we never do just footwork. It's never like we are just working on this. We have, This is a drill we're doing with the emphasis of utilising the zero step where possible. And as soon as you add that scoring system in there, you get one point of your score, you get two points if you utilise um, the zero step. Players, you know, they're all competitive. So, you know, they, they want to win. So they'll start to use it or try to use it more often. Um, we don't, you know, the thing is once season gets around, so from about start of March, there is no, we're just going to focus on the footwork by then. We're, we're, hopefully we've got it ingrained. If we haven't, that's not happening that season. So yeah, yeah, skip yeah. it. Juniors, um, I, I would say 10 to 15 minutes of an hour and a half session um, and I guess I could probably relate the domestic training to an individual session because about 45 minutes to an hour uh, we're, we're probably spending 10 minutes on footwork and finishing so we're adding the layups with that footwork so you're kind of two birds one stone well, I don't think you know we're all time poor with our team so I don't think we can do one drill that just focuses on one element at all and that's something we're, we've really steered cleared of um, so, yeah, we're, we're, we're multi-layering every drill to use it. So, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Hopefully. Um, can you take a backward step on the second step? Can you take a, can you take a backward step on the second step, like a shot fake, floater fake, and then re-attack? Uh, I don't know uh, so, we use, we use the, the step back, like, so, you know, let's say we go, right foot across the body, forward on the 45, back to our left, and then we had uh, like the third step in there. Look, it hasn't transferred to a game. Uh, we do, we've done it a little bit of training. Um, when people come to get their shooting routines done, we've added that in there. Yep. No, can you do it? I'm not an official. Uh, has it transferred to a game? No, it hasn't. Yes. Um, but again, our main goal, and look, that's not to say it can't be done. I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but our main goal is downhill attacking um, to the ring. 
um, utilizing the zero step where it's needed. So we haven't really practiced going away from the ring because that's against our, our philosophy. But again, that's not to say it's wrong or it can't be done. Yeah, for sure, for sure. No, I think that's great. I think the one thing, and I think that's it for most of the questions or tried to merge a few together. Um, I think the one thing that's great is it, it really fits your philosophy and you're really, you know, you're really buying that and selling that to the, to the players. Um, and I think the thing that makes me reflect on my coaching, not to make any of this about me, um, but the, uh, I was in the same meeting you're talking about where they went through all the zero step and all that sort of stuff. And I've done a very little, little part to try and learn it and teach it. And yeah. you know, Harrison, you've gone all in and it's great to see. And like I said, it's really, it does give me anxiety to sort of break away from those traditional things for all those reasons you said, um, and being trying, trying to be really good at fundamentals and all that. So uh, it's certainly given me a lot more understanding. I'll enjoy going back and watching and breaking that down. Um, and hopefully that we can get that video out to coaches that you know, comes up nice and clean because I know the internet yep. uh, will be varying. So, but I think that was um, you know certainly my key takeaway. I'm sure a lot of coaches will have stuff. Um, from that is there any other questions coaches or any other thoughts g before we uh move on no i might think if anyone does want to you know touch base and talk about it more like yeah i'm more than happy um to talk about it you jump online i've got a fair bit of stuff on there that that'd probably give a bit more in-depth uh look at how we implement it so by all means go check that out um and if you've got any questions i'm more than happy to talk mate and and yeah, keep the conversation going. Yep. No, really appreciate it, G. Um, I think the, um, yeah, I think a lot of people will get a lot out of that. Um, and it'd be very good. And if there is stuff after it, we'll, um, we'll follow up. But I um, yeah, appreciate your time. And make sure everyone gives uh, Hillier Hoops a follow because um, there's some great content there. And um, can inc- I can hopefully understand it a little bit more. So that was, that was great, mate. Thanks for that. Uh, appreciate it, mate. Uh, just quickly, I'll pass over now to um, to Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy, obviously, um, his resume is is very extensive. For again, another young coach, uh, he's coach been a head coach at WNBL level um, uh, internationally with New Zealand, coached the Olympics, uh, and and was almost for, almost close to ten years uh, the New Zealand uh, national team coach, director of coaching at Sunbury, and NBL coach at Knox. Um, Really looking forward to, to Kennedy getting into uh, his topic. Um, if anyone knows Kennedy, he is the ultimate professional and prepares um, with great detail, and I'm sure we'll, we'll see that today. So um, I'll pass over to, to Kennedy for his presentation. Thank you uh, very much, Reese. Hopefully uh, everybody can hear me. Um, just an apology to start with. If you uh, are... <clears throat> Hear all the streaming in the background. Um, I can promise you that I'm not harvesting neighbourhood cats due to the lack of meat in Australia right now. Um, that would be mine and my wife's three-week-old son. So um, he's, he's we're just going through that phase where, you know, he's, he's learning about the big world. So uh, it's been a great time um, over the last three weeks learning how to become a, a father. And uh, I can tell you my wife's doing an amazing job. So... Um, just some shout outs. Um, first of all, uh, Reese and, and Wyndham Basketball, really appreciate you um, for firstly giving me the invite and the opportunity to talk and uh, obviously putting this thing together. It's a, it's a really big deal. Um, G, obviously, uh, shout out to you just for your presentation. Um, you always seem to be ahead of the game and the zero step stuff. For me, I learned a whole lot today um, from that. And I just think the stuff that you're doing, not just with Pelio Hoops, but with uh, Southern Peninsula Basketball, I've always been a really big fan of, of, of your work and what you've done yourself and Lucas, I think, do an amazing job down there. Um, and your work speaks for itself, uh, producing you know, a decent intake worth of uh, Centre of Excellence players over the last few years. Um, and not to mention how you promote and give your young juniors opportunity early in senior programs and um, so the kids that are down there at Southern Peninsula are real benefactors of of, of Jared's and, and, and Luke's hard work and not to mention anybody else who's involved with uh, with that. Just on the back of his presentation, I mean obviously I've coached against Japan, China, Korea, Taipei and I can tell you right now that uh, to defend them and the open court um, in one-on-one contests and close-out situations is incredibly difficult um, 
and you know, again, to get ahead of the game, I think the stuff that G's presented on is going to be extremely beneficial for any of the coaches who have, who attended tonight. And the other to shout out I want to make is, uh, is well, there's a couple more. Layson Perkins, he's actually a coach who has uh, put something like this similar together at the moment with uh, a number of coaches around the world. So uh, perhaps I can get a link to everybody so you can uh, perhaps join in on that also. Um, but again, just the opportunity to be here tonight has been great. Um, and just again, last last but not least, obviously, coaches um, who are here tonight, big shout out to you. Um, you know, obviously, you're on here online tonight, doing the right thing, staying at home, keeping your social distancing right, and, and working on your craft. Um, obviously, it's an incredible, incredibly difficult situation we find ourselves in right now. Um, you know, for many of us in sport, um, you know, we're, we're sort of sitting here wondering what's happening with our jobs and. Um, I know a lot of people are out of work and you know, obviously a lot of people are you know, losing their lives to this thing. So um, I think it's incredibly important that we have things like this to, to keep us focused and uh, to keep us grounded. Uh, so I'm incredibly grateful. Um, all the links and anything I show tonight, um, I'm more than happy to share it. I'm more than happy to send the PowerPoint presentation out. Um, I've uploaded all the video uh, to YouTube. <coughs> so you'll get plenty of, uh, plenty of links. I'm happy to send you all as well. Um, now, just guess, just briefly, just on coaching is, you know, the reason why I coach and the only reason why I ever started coaching is I wanted to help others and I wanted to see others succeed. Um, you know, obviously, I played for a certain time. Um, that career was short-lived. Uh, coaching was probably a lot easier, um, you know, and when I got into coaching, the motivation was only purely to help people. Um, and now, obviously, as a coaching director at Sunbury Basketball, uh, I have a similar role where I get to help young kids and, and, and coaches with their craft and their game. Um, and also, I love to share my knowledge and passion for the game of basketball. So, um, me not being on a court and presenting this way is different for me. So, um, I'm outside of my comfort zone. So, I guess I'm growing and developing as well. So, without any further uh, delay, I'm just going to share my screen for a minute and put you on to some, uh, my cup from presentation, which I'll go through. So. Hopefully, uh, it comes through really clear for everybody. I have uh, slowed the video down, so it should uh, with, with some luck. Now, just for those of you who are currently um, watching on, a, on an iPhone or something, it would probably pay to watch from a, a, uh, a large screen. Um, it certainly would be better with the video. Um, so hopefully you can you can see this relatively well. So today I'm going to present on uh, pick and roll sequences, um, and this is just what I teach. Um, some of these different parts I've stolen from different coaches in, in, in different uh, organisations. Some of this I've stolen from Barcelona Victoria. Some parts I've stolen from other coaches around the world. Um, but when I'm teaching pick and roll play for guards and forwards, or what I'm going to try and utilise as handlers and screeners today. Um, this is what I like to teach in the sequencing I'm teaching with players uh, throughout. So this is relevant to anyone at any level, whether you be, uh, you know, a domestic coach, uh, under 12s all the way through to seniors. Um, I'll teach it the same way, uh, irrespective of the, uh, the age or level of the athlete. Um, obviously, I may want to get the information as I go. So, um, Look, I'm sure everybody knows what a pick and roll is, but uh, this is the Wikipedia explanation from the NBA. Uh, the pick and roll, also called a ball screen or screen and roll in basketball, is an offensive play in which a player sets a screen pick for a teammate handling the ball and then moves towards the basket, rolls to receive a pass. Uh, pretty basic explanation. Um, but again, and you'd be amazed the amount of times as a coach that you teach something and I think sometimes we're guilty as coaches that we just, we expect the players to know uh, without explanation. So, and I, I'm certainly been guilty of that many times as a coach. Um, so we have a duty as coaches to explain everything. So I'm gonna go through the next part here. So guards, um, when I say guards, I'm just gonna to refer to them as ball handlers or handlers today. Um, and the reason being is that using a pick and roll is not, um, just a guard skill it's a basketball skill and i think when we're teaching skills uh, whether it be posting up or, or advancing the ball up the floor with um, some form of handle was that every player has to be able to be able to play every position of some sort or at least have the skills to play 
Um, and again, the Euros are probably the best in the world at demonstrating that. Um, so, yeah, I've said guards in this situation, but really, I mean, handlers or ball handlers. Um, and what I use is six S's to explain. So I'm going to go through these teaching sequences. Um, as we all know, the pick and roll was a very common action in most offensive systems around the world. Um, obviously, the NBA utilizes a lot of late clock. Um, Euro League, watching a Euro team, you're going to see plenty of uh, pick and roll play. Obviously, the NBL, the WNBL, we're based in Australia, um, and obviously any FIBA event. Um, and just a statistic for you, there's an average of 25 to 28 pick and roll possessions per game in most top leagues. Um, so it's a, you know, NBA level, you're going to have an average at the absolute highest scale. You're going to have up to 28 points per game of pick and roll play. Um, and the lowest teams are going to score up to 12 points per game out of pick and roll play. So some teams obviously much more effective at it than others. So first, this I'll go through with the, uh, the handler. First of all is the setup. And that's the first S we're teaching kids. And that's the ability to use a pivot, uh, a rip through, a ball fake, a jab step, uh, obviously a dribble back down or a crab dribble, an up fake, or an in-out or hesitation move of some sort. And the goal of the setup essentially is to allow time for the screener to arrive. Um, you know, obviously getting called for moving screens is an extremely frustrating thing. Um, from my experience, more times than not, it's been because the guard hasn't had the patience to freeze or sink their defender um, and have the poise to wait. Uh, often it's been the guard's fault. Obviously, sometimes forwards can move their hips, not be in the correct stance, um, but I'll get to forwards later on. For now, I'm talking about the, the guards and their ball handlers. Uh, but again, using your setup, again, is about freezing your, your defender or forcing the defender into the screener's body or putting them into a position where they have to go under the screen or over the top. And obviously, if you're, if you're a shooter and you can make them go underneath, that's a great thing. Or if you're a penetrator and you can force them to come over the top with you, that's a great thing for you as well. So I'm just going to play this video here. It's in slow motion, so you should be able to see it. It's a short delay. Just going through some sequences. So a little up fake there by Skylar Diggins. And this one here of Milos Teodos, it's just a little in-out move to freeze his defender and shift into the left side of the floor. Same again, a very, very small jab to create space. In fact, I'm just going to go back to that one and just freeze it slowly. I mean, it's really subtle. And I had a great coach as a junior, and he used to tell me it was, and I still use the same to this day, it's the things that don't get your name in the newspaper that win your games of basketball. He wasn't specifically saying that to me because I wasn't all about the flair and the flashy stuff. I was just a raw meat and potato sort of player. But, uh, that small jab there is enough to shift the defender, and I just think that's so subtle. Again, a little crab dribble and back down to sink the player underneath the screen. A similar situation there, back down and crab dribble to sink the player underneath the screen. A little in-out dribble into a hesitation and crossover. So I think we get the idea there is to do different types of setups we can use to set our defender up and then use a screen. Um, so some great examples there, some of them from my team, some of them from the NBA, some of them from Euroleagues. Um, sometimes some of them give the absolute best examples in those situations. So the next S we look at, the second is the seal. And that's about using your footwork and body to seal your defender behind you. Um, and that can be achieved by getting your heel sealed on, this, on the screener's heel. So I'll give an example of that in the video, um, but also getting your shoulder to the screener's hips. Um, but not allowing any space between you, between the screen for the defender to be able to get through. Um, and obviously the goal is to allow no space for the defender if they fight over the top, forcing them into the in-jail position if they fight over the top. So I'll explain that and, and, and give you some, some context in the video. Um, in most situations as a coach, you want to be able to teach a you know, a number of different types of footwork, um, whether that be onside or cross-step footwork. Generally, cross-step is the most effective 
um, when using strings. But obviously, if you're on the dribble already, um, you, may not, you may not necessarily get that option. So I'm just going to show you some video here on the steel. Now, these are pretty short and sharp, so I will show you twice. It may seem funny, but you know, sometimes if I'm working with an under 16 group of boys at Sudbury, for example, um, if I can show them some NBA clips, it, it's, a, it's a lot better than them having to watch my big V women or you know, the, the New Zealand national team I used to case. They're not, they're not interested in that, but if I can show them Donovan Mitchell or somebody, uh, that's great. But if I just show you that and stop that one right there, I mean, you can see Milos Teodosic's foot not quite sealed behind the heel there. But if you can get heel to heel, that's great. But it, as you can see, he sealed the defender behind him. In same situation here, hasn't got his heel behind the heel, but he's got his shoulders to the hips of the screener and forced the defender behind. And in this situation here, Donovan Mitchell's allowed a little bit of space, but not enough for a human to get through now. This position here where the defender is behind the offensive play, that's the position we call the in jail position or in the NBA, that's the term they use. Um, if you YouTube, um, I'm sure if you typed in in jail, um, basketball, that's really important you add that key point. Um, I'm sure you're probably gonna find plenty then. In fact, there's a great clip that a, uh, a young coach put together with a lot of video detail on, on the in jail position. So it's a great, one probably a term that you're probably going to use for your more advanced players um you know of course if you're coaching any team and they're starting to grasp these concepts quickly um, of course it's relevant to anyone that's uh, that's ready for it so we're going to move on to the next part so we've got the uh the setup the seal and now we're up to the separation the ability to separate so once your player has their player sealed and force them under or over the screen or into the screen um it's, it's really important the player has the ability to change speed and tempo um, and obviously get downhill. So really important you can create as much separation between you and your defender. And the more separation you can create from your defender, uh, obviously the, you know, the, the ball screeners, the screeners defender is going to have to help or compensate or defense are going to have to rotate to help out. So the more separation you can create, the, the more strain you're going to put on the defense. So again, I'm just going to go through some video here. So, I mean, that's a small amount of separation, but and I'm just going to go through that one one more time really slowly. And you can see, obviously, the distance between the ball handler and the defender there is enough to force and draw almost two defenders or almost three. And by the time he gets into the paint, you know, you could basically throw a blanket over all five defenders there. And he's got pretty much his choice of any one of the receivers on the outside. And this offensive guy here is such a magician that he's able to pass the most defended player and somehow find a way. So the ability to separate puts all that separation and strain on the defense. And similar in that situation there, um, Again, I, th I think those are two really good examples of that, which moves us on to the next two phases. I, I think these two pretty much work hand in hand. And, and four and five is the ability to scan and score. So, you know, the next job of the ball handler, I've already set my player up, I've sealed them behind me, I've separated, I've drawn defense, is now, well, I need to scan the floor and find out, well, well, firstly, what are my scores? My checklist always is what, what's my score? How am I being defended in the, the screening action or the pick and roll? Is it uh, a sag or a soft show? Is it a hard show? Is it a switch? Um, you know, what is the screener's defender doing? How am I being defended? And secondly, well, then is my roller open? Uh, and if they're not, well, then why are they not open? And what receivers have, do I have available to me? Because perhaps there's some help from elsewhere, such as tagging from the strong or weak side of the floor. So the checklist is, is pretty simple. It's, uh, well, what is what is my defender done? What has the screener's defender done? What are my scoring options? Is the roller or rim runner open? And where's the next defensive rotation coming from yeah. in those situations? So uh, pretty, 
pretty simple. Uh, just to give you some context, uh, guys like uh, a Trey Young or a Damian Lillard in the uh, NBA, and you can find the stuff in advanced stats in the NBA. I'm having to send anyone the link if they're unsure where to find it. Um, both of them average 15 points a game. I mean, you know, and if you think about that, if you could take away 15 points from somebody from defending the pick and roll effectively, that's a pretty big chunk of, of those two players. Uh, you know, their scoring capacity, so they're very efficient at using this stuff, but the ability to obviously find your score and your teammates' scores is so important. So that fourth and fifth phase that we talk about, we talk about the ability to scan the floor and score. Um, for junior kids, you might use terminology such as just getting your eyes up. Um, eyes on the rim. And if your peripheral vision's great, well, then obviously you should be able to see corner to corner. Um, for me, I like to tell my players to, first of all, check how the defender defending the screen is playing me and then check corner to corner and it just gives you a, a great understanding of well, where the defense is rotating from um, and that's particularly in situations where it's going to be an aggressive show which is you know, my situation of seeing that as generally at a higher level you're going to be defended that way more times than not um, obviously drops and, and, and ice sort of coverage is, is pretty commonplace these days but uh if you have a team full of shooters and you're investing your time in that and you have great ball handlers, well, the last thing they want you doing is down here when forcing teams into rotation. So show just a little bit of video here to give you some context on that. Some of the clips you're going to see on double ups, which is fine. Um, but again, eyes are up. I know a lot of coaches don't like to teach players to jump to pass. I'm okay with jumping the pass to the ball, uh, especially if you've lost Tia Dosic. You, you can do whatever you like. Um, that's a great one there just because he completely fakes the defense out with his eyes there so that defender that's highlighted right now you know, he starts to look at his offensive player to draw him out and then makes a no-look pass so his ability to see the floor and, and suck defenders in and make them think that the ball's traveling one place when it technically is going to get out of the other is He's just great. He's one of the best pick and roll players in the world, in my opinion. Uh, plays for the, the Serbian national team. Um, so, again, eyes up on all these two. You'll never see any of them with their eyes down. Their eyes are always up looking for their score and their teammates' scores and how the defense rotates. So, hopefully, that's given you uh, some context. And the last one, which I think is really important um, I've used my setup, I've sealed my player. Put them behind me. I've separated. I've got downhill. I've scanned the floor. I haven't got a score. My teammates haven't got any score. Well, now I've got to find space. And to re-space the floor is a, is a great skill. And what you'll find with most, uh, and, and, and I get the same with senior players, is we, we attack, we get downhill, our options are depleted, we pick the ball up, and we completely freeze our offense, and we allow the defense to recover and, you know, we allow the defense to get in the passing lanes and now I'm in a lot of trouble. So the ability to space is really important. Get outside the three-point line and create an angle and now either feed the post, reverse the ball, get to the next side of the offense and the next action of the offense. So a really uh, small example here. I'll play this one twice for everybody, but uh, short pick and roll at the elbow here. Little hesitation, sees there's no, no scoring options, re-spaces the floor. And now he's going to get another pick and roll. So I'll just show that one one more time. Slow motion. Or a slower motion. It's great. His eyes are up. Sees the floor. Sees there's no scoring option, no passing option. Recreate space. I think that's a great thing for an offense. And if you ask any coach in any, uh, you know, WNBL, NBL level, and you ask them what were the three most important things in, in their offensive system, I, I can tell you now, one of those points is going to be space um, with every single coach. So, the ball handler, those are the six S's that we would, uh, that I would teach, teach them through in terms of sequencing and what they should be looking to do within each of those sequences. Um, and the next part, obviously, well, that's our, our forwards, our, our screeners. And again, no different to what I said before. Uh, forwards are not limited to being screeners. Obviously, guards can be screeners. You see a lot of those horns actions these days where I mean, Cary Graff used to be the master of the horn stuff. Um, you know, I knew, I knew whenever I was playing or coaching against Australia when she was the coach or coaching against the Canberra Caps, 
that I had to uh, be prepared to defend a lot of pick and roll, a lot of horns action. Um, she was the absolute queen of running that stuff. And, you know, she would often have guards, like, you know, Jess Bibby, for example, spotted up on one side of the floor, the guard would go off the guard side and flare the guard. So you will often have a lot of uh, guards sitting pick and rolls. And you see it in the NBA now with a lot of ghost screen action. So again, um, Fords aren't limited to sitting uh, pick and rolls or on ball screens. It, it can be anyone's game. So first S, and, and I'm sure if you, you know, you've been around the, the Basel Victoria High Performance Program for you, before, you've probably heard this one. Um, the screen's first responsibility is to sprint and create as much separation between them and their defender as possible. Um, and I want you to think about it if, if, if the, the Ford sprints, and, and it can be really difficult towards the end of the game sometimes where you're gassed and you've played a lot of minutes. Um, you know, this is why we have to condition ourselves to play for as hard as we can, for as long as we can. Um, but we want to sprint to create as much distance as possible. The larger the distance, the bigger the, uh, the advantage. And well, the advantage for the offense. And if you think about it, if the team you're playing against typically traps or, or hard shows, even if it's a short, soft drops coverage, um, if you create a lot of separation between you and your defender as a screener, those, those coverages become extremely difficult. And you know, as the guard comes off the screen now, the foot has a lot of ground to cover to recover. Um, to the ball handler. So sprinting is the most important first component, <laughs> which I'll give you some, um, some context here. I think this lad here does a great job, creates plenty of separation, even though they got a hard show. Really obviously difficult for the Ford to be able to show aggressively in that situation. This is more of a slip screen than a, uh, uh, an actual screen itself. I think this one here is a really good demonstration. Big sprints up, and if I, sorry, just, God, that's fine, right here. So if I just go back to this one here, I mean, even though it's drops coverage, you know, you can see the amount of distance between the screener and the defender. And any good player these days are going to be able to snake that and get into any, any form of space and really create some problems for defense. So. You know, that all came from the Bigs' hard work and their ability to sprint and create separation. And similar here. And I, I think I saw Sammy Grugan on the... Uh, on the um, <laughs> here watching. So sorry to bring this one up, Sam. Um, but this one here is just uh, with the uh, Vic Metro team last year. But that's a lot of separation um, between our big there and, and, and the defender. And obviously creates a lot of space for the guard to be able to get downhill and force the defense into rotation. So it gives you some idea and some context on the importance of the big screen creating that separation. Well, the next one is the ball screener is to smash the player. And the screeners have that responsibility to prepare themselves to make contact um, with the ball handler's defender by first of all, lowering their stance. And, and I think two thirds of your height is a good target. Um, and that, that prepares them to absorb contact and widening their stance um, to get their feet outside their shoulders. Uh, Guy Malloy with the, uh, the Melbourne Boomers tells his players too wide. So he wants to get twice as wide as your body um, to be able to create obviously uh, a good base to set a good screen. And I think it's really important as a screener not to allow too much space. And, you know, again, the, the more space you have from the ball handler's defender, or the more space that defender has to manoeuvre themselves either around you, underneath you, um, and avoid your screen. So I think anywhere between centimetres, with the exception of a back screen or a step up, where obviously you have to give... I believe it's a step and a half or a metre and a half legal space. Um, but you can basically get as close to the player as you need to in any wing pick and roll drag screen. Um, so getting as close to the player as you possibly can is so important so the defender can't negate your screen. And then also you need to consider your angles. Um, so the smash component there or sequence is about getting those parts right. Um, the NBA tracks screen assists and... Um, 
Marcin Gortat sets an average of 22.5 screens a game. That's a stat from 2017. Um, but he also averaged the most screen assists per game of, of 6.8. That's probably outdated now. It's probably Stephen Adams these days. But uh, again, just to give you some context with video, um, hopefully the examples are, are good. They're not the best. But uh, again, we've seen this one already, but I think he gets nice and low, creates contact, at least delays the... The ball handler's defender, again, good contact. Doesn't have to be a massive amount. Again, we've seen that one already. Uh, but obviously, we're looking at a different phase of the screen here. And again, we've seen this one, but much the same. Makes contact, delays the defender, gets low, and, and absorbs contact. So I think that's a really important one because... You know, in some WNBL teams I've, I've worked with before, is we've started that, the, the amount of missed screens and, and making contact so important is nothing worse than sitting a, a screen on Casper the Ghost. Um, so hopefully that's given some context to the, uh, the smash component there. Well, no different for the ball handler. Obviously, the Ford has to separate as well. And once they've sprinted, they've smashed and made contact, they now have to separate. And to separate could be to roll or what I, I call and refer to as rim running uh, these days or pop. So there's, there's obviously a number of different options as well as a breeze screen, which I'm not going through today. Um, but it can be done with obviously a forward pivot. And the advantages of forward pivoting is it's generally quicker and more efficient with your footwork. If you think about a forward pivot after a screen and I turn my feet and now they're facing the basket, it's a lot easier to run and sprint downhill if my feet and toes are facing the correct way versus a, a roll can generally be slow with a reverse pivot. Um, I don't always get to shake my shoulders and my feet up to the basket and roll situation. Um, so for me, I'm generally teaching the rim run or forward pivot technique when I separate just because it, for me, it's more efficient. Um, and then obviously the last point is then making sure they can maintain vision with the ball handler once I'm rolling rim running or, or popping. Um, vision with the ball is really important for the, the screen, the, especially if the guard goes to throw you the ball and, and of course it gets missed. So just some examples here of good separation. I know you've already seen this one before, but again, makes great contact. And you can see turns his feet for forward pivot and sprints to the basket. So really efficient. And much the same again, same footwork, forward pivot, sprint to the basket, receive the ball. And again, forward pivot, sprint to the basket, receive the ball. So in terms of forward pivoting versus reverse pivoting, reverse pivoting is, and they're both relevant. And as a coach, you just need to make the decision on, <clears throat> you know, if you're coaching a junior team or it's domestic, you know, you obviously want to keep things simple to start with. You might just pick one. Um, you know, senior basketball, whether it be a big V, um, or even a, <clears throat> you know, a, a one's team at a, at a at club level, well, then obviously, you know, you might want to teach both, but master one first and then teach the other. I think the reverse pivot's great in a situation where there's been a switch and, and the Ford can roll with that reverse pivot footwork and, and seal the defender behind him and then not allow that guard to be able to recover back to the forward. So now the guard, the ball handler can go one-on-one -on -one and get downhill, you know, in a, against a big uh, defender. So that's probably when that, that, that footwork is, is most um, relevant. Last, uh, last couple here. Again, these two for me are the same. Four and five, the ability to seal and then space. So the last two jobs of the screener is to seal and create a target in the paint or the post area. Uh, or crash the offensive glass or find space to create space. And, you know, if you think about it, if the, the big sprints, they smash, they separate, and now they sprint to the, either the front of the rim and either if, you know, perhaps the handler's dealing with two players in a trap situation and they can see on the rim and create a target, well, that's going to draw somebody towards them um, and perhaps open somebody else up. So... The ability to sprint and seal after you separate is so important. Um, and if not, sometimes it can be, okay, well, my, 
my opportunity to score has been missed because perhaps the handlers missed me and they've shifted the ball on. Or if there's an angle to feed me the ball, I can continue to, you know, create a presence in the paint and, and, and post up. Or if there's not and that's been missed, well, now I need to space the floor. So what's my next job in the offense? So some examples of that here. And I might just go through these ones twice. Um, we picked that screen up pretty late. You can see the four there sitting down and sealing their player and then managed to draw another with their gravity. And, and that's actually my wife shooting the ball too. So found a good one there. Get some brownie points with the wife. Um, little step up screen, minimal contact, but the four does a great job of resealing to create an angle. For some reason that's paused itself. And, and found that player there for a, a score seal situation. This one here is a pretty old one from when I was coaching the, uh, the West Coast Waves against Guy Malloy. Um, Ford's obviously sprint smashed and separated. Now they're sealing. And you can see there uh, Lou, Lou Tomlinson at the top there. She's acknowledged that she can see it, but you know, perhaps the, the seal's too deep. In that situation and she shifted the ball on but the Fords moved and created space and got to the next side of the floor. This one here I think is the best example of of one. So makes makes contact, seals up, and obviously his player is still recovering, but seals his player behind to create a driving lane for this player here to get on the rim. So I think it's so important that you know, I think sometimes for screeners and particularly with juniors, yeah, they feel like they've set the screen, I've set my screen, the handlers come off my screen, I didn't receive the ball, my job is done. But you have a responsibility now to make your defender have to recover back to you or force somebody else to have to defend you. So, um, you know, I use the sequencing with, with juniors at summary and obviously with NBL1 players or Big B players or national team players. Um, for me, I use a lot of screens. Anyone who's coached against me before or watching in my games, you know that I'm sitting drag screens, step up screens, punch screens, pitch and pick action. There's always plenty of wing pick and rolls, middle pick and rolls. Um, you know, and I think it's uh, it's great fun to play if you're a, you're a screener and, um, you know, if you're a basketball player, and these days you love to come off screens and pick and roll play. So, for me, I enjoy teaching it. Um, it's something that I'm still trying to master. And again, I, hopefully you've all found that beneficial. And, and there's no doubt it's completely relevant to anybody at any level, um, whether you're under 12s, domestic, junior, uh, seniors, big B, um, or anyone beyond that. So um, if you want to follow me, I'm not that active on Twitter, I'll be honest. Um, reasonably active on Facebook and reasonably active on Instagram, but I've got my email there for anyone who wants to um, email me. I'm more than happy to pass on links. Um, but yeah, no, I really appreciate everybody's uh, time today. I'm just going to shut that one off and get you back here to uh, to allow me to talk about uh, the the subject of screening and the sequences sequencing of screening today. So, please, any questions? Um, yeah. There's, there's plenty, mate. Um, firstly, thanks. That was a great presentation. And as I sort of said at the start, I knew the detail would be there. Having coached against Kennedy at different levels, um, he's always um, he's always prepared and, 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 and detailed. And, and we saw that. So that was great for everyone. I think um, every coach at varying levels would have got a lot out of that. Um, one I'll throw to you first was... Um, Obviously, there's a lot of detail there. Would would you, if you're coaching 16s or below, minimise the amount of S's you use? Would you try and simplify it or would you still use the same and just sort of build the detail over time? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, look, I'll, I'll be honest, with, with, with 14s, um, which would be the, the last group at summary I work this stuff with, I mean, we threw all the S's at them. Um, in terms of the sequencing, they, they, they did a great job of picking this stuff up. Um, under 16s, again, they do a pretty good job picking this stuff up. So I, I certainly don't like to limit, and this is only my own personal coaching philosophy. Clearly, I'll set my standards as high as I possibly can. And if it's, 
you know, under the 12s, I'll, I'll coach them like anybody else. Obviously, if I have to bring it back and water it down, I will. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you could, no reason why as a coach, that's, you know, going to be your own personal preference if, you know, you need to figure that out if uh, perhaps your players are struggling with, with so much detail. You know, perhaps you only stick with three per per guard and ball handler and screener. There's no reason why you know, any coach can obviously adapt that to, to suit their teams or themselves. Um, but yeah, for me, look, I'll, I'll try and teach it as much as I possibly can. Um, and look, obviously, yeah, if the juniors are going to struggle with it, then I have to water it back down. Yep, yep. Um... So the angles of the screener, so depending on where it's on the court, what is your sort of teaching points on the angles of the screen? And then where do you want them to screen on the defender? Um, that was a question from a couple of the coaches sort of. Yeah, a good one. Like Give me a second and I'll just... Uh, we'll do it this way. Hopefully this can give you some good context. Um, so the question was angles of the screen and yeah, and then a teaching point, I guess, on on where you would yep. screen. What do you say? Where do you want them to screen the defender? You know, um, more traditional yep. back pocket, that sort of thing, I guess. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, obviously, let's just talk a bit. It was a wing pick and roll. Um, the forwards coming from the top. I mean, traditionally, it's pretty easy for a forward to run a straight line and and sort of screen with their back facing the sideline. Obviously, that doesn't always necessarily create the best angle um, for <clears throat> the guard to be able to turn the corner and get downhill when it's pretty easy for a guard to slide underneath that if it's a non-shooter. Um, one I picked up from Guy Malloy, which I always liked if it was a wing pick and roll, as an example, is he always to talk about an angled screen. Um, and for any of you who have watched his team this year, you wouldn't see a lot of pick and roll play um, he's running with a lot of, you know, good motion stuff and expecting spacing and ball movement. Um, but one he used to run was an angled screen where the forward run towards the nail and create a screen. But I think shoulders squared to the, uh, the sideline is just fine. Obviously, if you can get deeper that and angle your string, you know, almost with your back towards the basket, that's great. That creates a lot of problems for defences. Uh, clearly, if it's a step-up screen, which is a screen where the guard's going downhill in transition. Um, obviously, you know, back to the baseline's always most important. Um, but for me, generally speaking, um, and I, you know, I've been fortunate enough to work with some really talented players, whether it be middle pick and roll or wing pick and roll. I mean, yeah, I think we do such a good job of, and the players I've worked with, and this is only credit to them, um, they do such a good job of selling their player behind the screen and being able to shoot the ball. You know, teams have no choice but to have to go over top. So the angles don't necessarily um, matter too much for us. Um, but again, I mean, obviously shoulders, you know, back to the sideline's good. Um, in terms of placement of the screen where the defender is, and hopefully this can give you a good example. If this was a defender, a bird's eye view of a defender defending this player here, and it was sprinting to a screen, and I was the screener. Um, I think a foot either side of the defender's feet is good. So right in the center line of your body. So if, if I went and took that away for a second, and the feet of the screener could be there, if that makes sense to everybody, obviously a left foot and a right foot. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to have either side of the toes and the heels of the defensive player. Uh, this way, they have no choice but to have to go underneath or over top of the screen. And if they're a really poor defender, well, they have no choice but to run into my screen. What about in the middle, Kennedy? What's your, what's your sort of um, middle pick and roll angles look like? Yeah, um, for me, sometimes with my back to the corner, if that makes sense. So we use the corners as an example. So if I was running a screen for a middle, you know, playing a middle pick and roll situation, the angle would be this way here. Um, obviously, if it's too flat, you know, like this angle here, in that situation, it can be really easy for the defender to get underneath. Um, but, you know, I think as a coach, and, 
you know, even at big V level, there, there aren't too many players where you can you can afford to go underneath their screens because, you know, most players these days have the ability to shoot the three ball. Um, so, I mean, for, for us, it's, 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 we make it incredibly difficult for players to be able to go under screens. Yeah. You know, they're only choice to go over, over the top. But, so that, doesn't, that really negates the, uh, you know, the angle. Um, but, you know, for junior coaches, and if you can't shoot the three ball, I think the really good angle is if it's a middle pick and roll, is back to the corner of the floor. Yeah. A um, couple more, mate. Just bear with me. Um, when do you start to teach pick and roll? Yeah, so you're a club director of coaching. Obviously, you're a high-level coach as well. But when do you start to build it in? Do you start from under 12s, 14s, 16s? I know when we had the um, Spanish coaches out last year, they wouldn't teach pick and roll until top age 16s, you know, sort of 15 and up. So is this an interesting question? Um, that sort of comes up is when when do you sort of build that that in from a club level? Yeah, we have this we have this um, <laughs> and I don't want to blame anybody for this. We have a interesting situation. We find ourselves in a Melbourne where we play in the VJBL when uh, a competition where you have to play your best basketball at the beginning of a season. And, and you know, I'm not saying that's uh, it's certainly not a cop out. You know, we, we have a responsibility to develop our players for the next level of basketball, um, no matter whether we're domestic coaches, Aussie hoops coaches, um, and you know, responsibilities and the passion of the game. In terms of when, I mean, for me, I think for all the coaches I'm working with, that they have to have some level of freedom to coach. Um, you know, we have some real base. Um, offensive and defensive principles at the club that we have and, and the rest is up to them and I'll do my best to guide them through um, you know the the what to do and what not to do um, but as much as I can you know it's up to them to sort of explore these things themselves me personally um, well if we're sitting pick and rolls and let's say our under 12 ones team from Sunbury are running pick and rolls and we've got kids who can't use their left and right hand <laughs> With the ball, can't defend in a one-on-one situation, can't lay the ball up to the left or right hand, and but they're masters of pick and roll play. We have a problem. Um, so again, for me, it's not going to be a. Um, I'm not going to put a limitation on when you can start teaching it. Personally, I don't have a, a preference one way or another. Um, but certainly, I would say that if we are teaching it, the kids better be good at all the other basic things first, and the the, the simpler fundamentals before we start teaching them how to play pick and roll. Yeah, for sure. Um, another one on the, the for the screener. Um, how do you teach the timing of holding screens? Is it more traditional or is it a tap and go? Um, or does it depend sort of how they're defending um, defending against you? Yeah, good one. Um, you know, I think I'll use the... Uh, I'll use the iPad for this one. Yep. Just give me a second. So, in terms of, yeah, the, the, what was sorry? The question was the level of contact. Yeah. So, yeah, is it a is it a hit and hold? Is it a tap and go? Like, what sort of the what sort of your teaching points here? You talked about the smash. Um, does it depend yep. on how they defend it, or is it you know yeah. type of athlete? What 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 sort of your teaching points on that was the question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, look, obviously, if you can hold the screen and hold the, as an example, if I was to set this screen, the defender was to get caught on the pick and my guard's going downhill when I've, you know, I, I think as soon as they get their shoulders past me, that's my indication to go. Yeah. Um, so once the guard has their play or the ball handler has their play sealed and they've separated, um, for me, irrespectively, that's time for the, the roller or the rim runner to, to move and get to the next uh next space on the floor. So that's for me, um, obviously, you know, again, tap and go is great. You'll see a lot of that in the NBA where they literally just have an arm bar. They just touch the player and then they move and sprint and separate from their player. Um, but for me, it's generally cued by the ball handler. Yep. Um, once they separated, that's my cue to go. Um, hopefully that answers the question. It's a, it's a, it was a, I mean, there was another question attached to it though. Was that it? No, 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 I think that um that answered it, mate. There's a lot more coming in, so I'll keep moving. Um, 
the the next one what's sort of the most common way you've seen you've run the step up screen a lot the punch screen what's the most common way um, you've seen or you've used to defend that and seen a success both either junior level you know nationals or even at senior level in WNBL so the step up screen yeah yeah yep. yep. um, but for most teams I mean and, and they do that they're really difficult to defend a step up screen um, most teams generally tend to use a, a drops coverage or, you know, drops and ice in that situation to me are essentially the same thing. Um, I'm just having some problems bringing up the, um, the screen here to be able to share play and, and show you um, what I'm doing. But look, most situations, I'll just go back to this, most situations are going to be drops, a drops coverage or ice. It's really difficult to show aggressively. Some teams will go, um, Japan, probably one of the best ones. They would go ice into a trap or drops into a trap situation uh, where the guard would follow the ball handler over top of the screen and play from behind. And the defender defending, defending the screener would have unreached distance from the screen and then play into a trap. Uh, those created a lot of problems for, for the, the tall fans when I was coaching. Um, but generally speaking, at state league level and WNBL level, you're generally going to see a lot of drops. Um, you know, short to deep drops coverage um, as well as, uh, you know, ice coverage, which to me essentially is the same thing. It's only really uh, the drops coverage if you allow the middle, if you're forcing it towards the sideline, which most teams would do. It, I guess it effectively makes it, a, you know, an ice coverage. Yep. Um, one more. Uh, what sort of communication do you use? So say it's a side, uh, side ball screen. Um, do you call which side the screen's coming from from the force two? What's sort of your communication there on the um, pick and roll defense? Okay, well, yeah. uh, I mean, in terms of pick and roll defense, uh, I probably have the luxury of <laughs> working with athletes that you know, I mean, I'll, I'll see them three times a week and I'll do individuals with them. Um, you know, I guess for the domestic coach or the BJFL coach, a little more time for. Um, we obviously scout, so I know, and, and in the teams I'm coaching, we know exactly where screens are coming from. Um, we'll know our opposition teams' offences in advance, so we don't generally have to tell whether the screen's coming from the left or to the right. Um, but in terms of communication points, if I'm defending the screener, my first responsibility is to pull screen as loud as I possibly can. And then my next responsibility is to communicate how I'm going to defend it or how we're defending that as a team three times um, assertively and you know so whether that be drops coverage you know first responsibility is screen and my next responsibility is you know show 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 three times as loud as I possibly can and then obviously my next responsibility is to get myself in the stance and prepare myself to defend that screen that way uh, um, but yeah if you're juniors screen left screen right uh, are great for uh, communication particularly if kids peripheral vision isn't great or their awareness isn't great I um, mean, again, I, it doesn't necessarily mean we're bulletproof with this stuff, but dealing with senior players, you have the, that luxury of knowing opposition team's offense, watching video, preparing yourself in that way. So you generally don't have to call if the screen's coming from the left and from the right. Um, so again, hopefully that's that's answered the question and given some, some food for thought. That's good, mate. Um, what about... Uh Another one, there's a lot coming in. So I'm trying to filter. I didn't realise how much pressure this would be uh, trying to get all these questions here. But uh, do you teach the re-screen um, and, and when is it applicable? So obviously defender goes under. Do you teach the re-pick or just do you want to keep moving it on? What's sort of your philosophy there? Yeah, I mean, within um, within my offence, and I mean, I, I, I'm a heavy flow coach. Um, it's not for everybody. Um, but for me, I, I enjoy coaching. I've been coaching it for some time. Again, I'll see if I can get this up and running again. Um, in terms of the re-screen, um, the screen obviously has a number of options. The first one's obviously firstly to screen and roll um, or screen and rim run, which is the same thing. The difference is in footwork. If it's a rim run, it's a forward pivot. If it's a roll, it's a reverse pivot. Um, pick and pop, obviously pop to space and re-screen or slip. So you have those sort of five options there as a screener. Um, 
Yeah, for me, the rescreen, generally speaking, is is when a defender goes underneath. So I'll run, and again, for those who have either watched any of my teams play, um, this would be a really common action. Uh, this three-side action here will sprint this player through to the weak side corner. Our corner player will make a V cut, and then we sort of pitch the ball, and then we go and pick it. So once that's happened, F4 is now sprinting to the screen. Um, you know, a lot of defenders, the easiest way to defend that would be to go underneath it and try and beat us to space. So for me, it's an automatic read. If the defender goes underneath, and I apologize for the, uh, the, the drawings here. But if the defender goes underneath in that situation, we'll automatically rescreen it and attack back downhill. Again, so for me, that's just a situation within my offense where that's applicable. But generally speaking, yeah, if the defender goes underneath, um, I'll allow the forward in any offense that I'm working with to uh, to rescreen. But that's probably the only time we're looking at rescreening. Is there certain types of actions where you prefer to do that, like um, drag, step up, middle pick, or yeah. that wing yeah. pick, or is it just a general rule? Yeah, look, again, probably specifically for me, it's generally any pitch and pick action where it's wing screens. Um, and I generally stay away from it. Maybe it's a middle pick and roll, but generally speaking, any step ups or drag screens, we want the forward to get out of the way straight away. Um, and, and in fact, sorry, because I know I missed the question before. Um, there was two questions attached and it just dawned on me that I didn't answer one in terms of the level of contact. I will just show, because I think this is really... Uh, good for anyone at any level. You'll see this with a lot of um, pro teams. Um, whether it be ghost screening or slip screening, um, you know, in most situations, if, if I'm waiting for a screen to be set and I'm handling the ball and my defender's on me, and let's just use a drag screen situation, um, what you'll find a lot of teams doing at a higher level is, because most guards, that really good ones, will change their feet and prepare themselves. So now that when they are, uh, they'll change their stance so it's easier for them to fight over the screen. And what a lot of teams will do is the screener now will read that and separate straight away. So they'll make no contact. And if you really think about that, and X4 has to recover with their player, that puts the defender in a really horrible position because you know, uh, four mans on the rim, x fours follow, They've changed their feet, and now they're in a position where they're giving up the middle of the floor. So uh, the level of contact isn't necessarily always relevant in the situation because if the defender changes their feet and the offense is smart enough to, you know, to to react quickly to that, uh, that's just a situation where, you know, making contact and uh, you know isn't isn't necessarily relevant. So I thought that was a good one just to share. Sorry, yeah. to backtrack. Definitely, definitely, there's um, a lot there. Um, just a couple more, some more, some advice ones. So um, basically, you know, you've coached at 16s nationals, so predominantly, you know, higher levels. But for juniors, what's your advice or guidance on guarding pick and rolls? What sort of strategies do you think work effectively? Um, what would you give to a, you know, a coach that's going to coach at the nationals at under 16s? What would you say, suggest? Sorry, so to, to, at 16s national level? Or yeah, that sort of level or 16s VJBL, you know, something like that. Um, yeah. A reasonable level of basketball. Sure. I mean, again, this is only my own personal preference, so it's not, it's not right or wrong one way or another. I don't teach, uh, and this is just for me at my level, I don't teach any situations where the guards are allowed to go under the screen. We're always going over the top. Um, and there's enough evidence out there to say that if you can put enough pressure on the ball handler, uh, the, the, you know, you've got so much more of a chance to, to create a turnover. If you go underneath and you give that guard with the ball handler space and time to think, um, you know, they're going to put themselves in a better position to score. So for me, that's, you know, I don't generally teach going under screens. I think it's really outdated now, particularly with the way teams can shoot the ball. Under 12s where, you know, under 14s, it may not be as much, but then I've played against plenty of teams from Werribee and Southern Penn before where our juniors have been killed from the three-point line because we've gone under. So my advice would be pick one method. Um, you know, your simplest is jamming and going underneath. That is the simplest one to teach. 
and, and then work your way from there. If you're domestic level, that's a, an effective way. Um, drops coverage is, is also effective and simple. Uh, um, again, hard show. It's, it's, not, it's not that difficult. To, to teach and, and I'm just in the process now of putting some video together which I'm happy to share with anybody once I get it up um, on, on defending pick and roll play but there's plenty of good stuff out there so for me just pick pick one method do a great job of that and, and then build on that from there yeah uh, I might just go one more uh, Ken um, undersized teams how would you how do you sort of defend against that I mean I know we're, we're getting a little bit off topic more into the defensive side now but a lot of the coaches sort of ask questions on the defensive side. So, um, yeah, if you've got an undersized team, you know, and you might have had that with New Zealand, um, yeah, how would you how you sort of combat that lack of size? I know, Lloyd, I know you're on here when you ask that question. You're getting ready for NBA 1. Um, look, the... Sorry, now I completely lost track because I thought I'd be a smart, smart aleck. Um, <laughs> undersized, <laughs> undersized guarding picker. Oh, yeah, look, so, I mean, obviously, if, if I'm an undersized team, switching's great. Um, and I'll use Japan as an example because I think they they do an excellent job. And I'm just going to, again, I'll share the uh, the iPad screen and hopefully the, hopefully the, um, the diagrams... Hopefully, I'm doing the diagrams and the explanation justice by my ability to draw. Um, I think switching is great in a situation where you're undersized. It can be really disruptive. Um, if I was, an, if I, if I'm coaching an undersized team, I'm looking to switch stuff. But what the Japanese do an exceptional job of, and again, if I use a pick and roll as an example, X1 and you know, X4 this situation is they'll switch but traditionally when teams uh you know switch is they use the string x1 goes underneath and then x4 picks up x1 and, and for me again it creates a, a very small window of opportunity where the ball handler has time and space to think and make good decisions so what the japanese do a great job of and this was completely, I was completely unaware of this method until I saw it and I've run with it ever since, is they'll switch over. So as one uses the screen, X1 will go over top of the screen to make it, uh, the offensive player think that the guard's going over top with them and X4 will switch aggressively onto him. And as the offensive player rolls, the screener rolls, X1 will basically just sit on top of them yeah. um, and yeah. switch over top, which I think is a really effective way because you don't give the ball handler any time to, uh, to think and it will give them any space at all. Well, obviously, the disadvantage of that is if, if it's a great passer, you know, they're going to be able to pass over top to space. But then if your split line defense is in the correct position or you're great at tagging as a defensive team, um, that's going to become really difficult to make that pass. And, and you're getting a, any pass that has it's in the air, that has air time and space, is a is a is a win for the defense, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I think that's that's great. I actually really like that method um, switch in front. I think that's really uh, effective, especially for smaller teams. So I think that's great um, info. Um, hopefully, I haven't missed anyone. Like I said, I uh, didn't realize the pressure of. Um, actually taking the questions, especially when they're firing in so quickly. So hopefully I uh, did that justice and um, really just want to thank um, uh, Jared and Kennedy again, because I think the detail they put together in such a short period of time, I mean, I'm not joking that they got 26 out, 27 hours notice. We got on the phone yesterday and decided to, um, to make this happen and, um, you know, all credit to them. It was, you know, really high level presentation and I think a lot of coaches will get a lot out of that. So, um, Unless anyone's got any more parting words, that's basically it from me. I appreciate everyone's time. I think it was a, a great first initiative.